We are so happy to have uh, Kira Junos, as he, uh, VJ with uh, City News Vancouver, uh, joining us today. Uh, from natural disasters to unhoused issues, Kira has been there and uh, he's been there as a crew of one. And uh, he's here today to uh, share some tips and uh, what he's learned along the way. So with that being said, I will say, Kira, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. I mean, what, seriously, what a pleasure. I mean, it's been really cool kind of like, it, I've been taking inventory of myself of like what I've done for the last while to make this thing, you know, to make this job work for me. And yeah, now I've diluted it into this like, you know, small little presentation. I hope you guys all uh, are able to take something away. Let me go ahead and share the presentation with y'all. There will be some different, um, what, like little camera moves and some you know do here. I hope you're not motion sick. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it as smooth as possible. Um, so this webinar is going to go over some of the things that helped me thrive and survive in the field, uh, particularly when it comes to camera craft. I'd like to say that, you know, some of the things that this is in part of the disclaimer, some of the things that work for me uh, are in part because of a lot of the freedoms afforded to me at, at City TV and also the absence of other things that I, I don't really have. Like I can't make like really intense graphics like, all the time for all my packs, for example. So but that ties my hands like in another way. And I learned to get creative in other ways. Right. So let's uh, let's kind of get into it. A little bit about me. Um, basically, around 11, 11 years ago, I started as a music blogger in Vancouver. I was just writing stuff, you know, just like playing in bands and stuff. Um, why I ended up going into video journalism, for one, it's like, it's really fun. I think the format's great. I love cameras. I like how the visuals inform the writing. It's really stimulating on so many levels. I like to talk about something that I like to call like the nowness of video journalism. And um, that's because I think it requires a sense of presence in mind body and spirit. I know maybe that's too like woo out there for you, but, but like I, I just think it, it really is like that. Sometimes out there when you're in the field, you have to be really aware and get less cerebral and trust your instincts. And that kind of like kind of puts you into like a pseudo meditative state maybe sometimes because you're just like there and all you know is the now. And I really love that feeling. Um, here's some like fun pictures of me doing a lot of random things. Uh, I was effectively doing like print journalism throughout um, and after J school. Uh, I graduated with like, a BA in journalism and a minor in economics at Kwantlen Polytech University. After those days, I did some like freelancing for some newspapers in the region, but it was like, I was pretty broke though. So um, I, 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 never got, I was like selling guitars for a bit. I made more money like playing music in, in bars and private functions. And then eventually a local television station was looking for a PA. A guy had a who worked at a coffee shop um, up the street from me, produced his own show there, told me they needed a PA. And pretty much like a week later, I was very literally wrapping cables there for the next three years. I learned everything about like editing, rundowns, shooting with like electronic news gathering cameras, ENG cameras, producing commercials, like multicam switching, robotic cameras, set design. Like I was like building sets. I was like just drilling holes in walls. Like I really did everything, including being a VJ, right? Um, so like here, the top left photo of me, that's just me on Broadway in Vancouver, carrying all my gear. Um, the, the, in the bottom left, there's me with my colleague holding a drill up to my neck uh, when I was building a set. Uh, bottom right, there's me in Lytton uh, a year after it, it burned down um, because of like just really, really record breaking heat. Uh, and, um, and then here's me shoot in the middle of there, there's me shooting an interview inside of uh, a safe injection site on the downtown east side. Um, and then on, on the top right there, uh, yeah, that's just my, my city news BJ locker. Um, yeah, let's go to the next slide here. I kind of just like want to figure out who, who's actually in this room. Like we're wondering like who's actually here. If you, you know, maybe if you're like a student journal, can you sound off in the chat? Maybe let Trevor know who you, who you are. Are you like a print reporter? Are you like a really ancient reporter? <laughs> okay, I'm just like, like a like an experienced reporter who's like seen a lot. Um, if you want, I can you know, just give you a second to maybe pop into the chat. Let me know who you are, who's hanging out here. We have at least one student uh, student journalist, uh, print journalist as well. Um, student journalist, is there a print journalist? Okay, cool. And uh, some, oh, some nice. there. There's a TV well. North in, in, in that's a territory. It's very cool. People around the country. All right. Anyone else? BHDH News, Sean Cohen. Cool. Cool. Multimedia reporter, major markets. Wow. Yeah. We've got a pretty good mix going on here. We have students, we have professionals. Um, you know, we have pretty, people who are pretty experienced. Uh, oh, my colleague, Nick Westall at City News in Toronto. Nick Westall, hello. 
uh, someone who spent a year as a BJ Rosetta. Thank you, thank you. Cool. Okay, yeah, this is pretty cool. So it's nice to know uh, who's here. We got like a nice crowd of people. Do I have the first name? Oh, hello, hello, Joanne. Um, cool. Yeah, there's like a lot of a lot of folks here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch on to the next slide. But thank you for answering that. It's just nice to know who's around. You know, um, I mean, I think you know if you're if you're a student, uh, if you're just a print reporter, like I think everyone's poised to become a video journalist. Like, you know, it all depends on where you want to go, right? You could like learn to produce on your own or in a team, take the grant funding route, you know, like make stuff that way. Um, or you could take the TV journalism route. Uh, the format really kind of, the, of your video journalism really, really depend, I think, depending on the area you're in. Is it like, is it hosted content? Is it on narrated content? Is it just like aggregate video clips that you create with text as context? Are the TV journalism packs, like, I think just for experiences of kind of just like describing my own, uh, describing where I'm at, like, I'll tell you guys about TV news. Um, basically, near the end of my tenure at Joy TV, uh, which was that station that I learned everything at at the start of the pandemic, I applied to City TV, and the style was really widely similar because Joy Television is a division of Zoomer Media, which was owned, which is owned by Moses Snymer. Moses Snymer co-founded City TV back in like like the 80s or whatever. So you had this station in Surrey, British Columbia, far away from Toronto, that randomly had DJ-driven shows with the city news style. So it was like just a really weird pal parallel that I didn't expect. And some my first training video was like this ancient city pulse training video <laughs> with like old DJs like using like a you know you know using a digital a digital cameras on the shoulder and in their other hand. Um, but I think these days if you have a decent smartphone, you can pretty much do video journalism. Um, more reporters are using phone footage all the time. I think I, I've seen in like well, a lot of like uh, U.S. local stations like. Uh, I can tell that their their uh, journalists are like hosting content with phones, um, and uh, they're, they're shooting content with phones or a combination of footage from conventional ENG cameras and phones and drones. Um, and they're getting like even even better. Uh, like you know, for a long time, like smartphone zoom was something that I typically even when I shot with a phone, like. I wouldn't typically zoom, but then I saw the iPhone 14, my colleague showed me the zoom on that, and I could tell I was really astounded how far the technology, even for digital zoom, it, it's really, really coming along, and there's so many different peripherals you can get to really increase the quality of your shots now. That said, bu bu buying better audio gear uh, will, um, will really, I think, take your phone footage to the next level, and we're going to talk about that kind of stuff next. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me, like, what kind of helped me take uh, the stress off because BJing is, is pretty intensive. Um, technical, just like ability, um, I think it's really important to get to know your tech. As someone who files every day, this is the main thing that helps me forego the stress. Um, if you're comfortable with, you know, I'm comfortable with cameras, editing software, audio equipment, and with practice, you know, you kind of learn how it take long, how long it takes to give in, do any given task. I mean, as professionals, like, we should all be good at our job, but like taking time to just improve these technical parts can really help you get to the next level, make your life easier. And, and you know, not to mention you're often operating solo, in, in my case, as, as a VJ in the field, you're going to be doing a lot of this troubleshooting yourself. And sometimes you might run into an issue and you have no one to help you, so you have to do it on the fly. And I'm going to tell you like a practical reason why. Um, yeah, this point, just sort of speaking to my point, just, you know, building up the skill set will take pressure off during crunch time or when you're in a pinch. One time I was, uh, you know, I'll just like switch to my camera here. One time I was, um, I was at a shoot. Okay. It, it, it was, uh, it was just, I think in December, I think it was just started the snow in Vancouver. People suck at driving in Vancouver in snow. Um, I forgot all the SD cards for my conventional camera. I just forgot them. I am a VJ and I was like, wow, I just forgot everything. So what do I do? This was at a time where I hadn't made a fulsome switch to mobile DJing yet. So I was like slightly, slightly uncomfortable shooting just through the phone. And so what did I have with me? All I had was a mobile shotgun. Um, show you the one here actually. This mobile shotgun mic, it attaches to my phone with a little cable. This is all I had and I would attach it to my iPhone 14. This was it. So how did this end up informing my shooting process? Um, well, ideally, I would have liked to put a lavalier mic on my subject, maybe put my conventional camera on a tripod and just like do it that way, because that's what I'm comfortable with. But I didn't. So what did this mean? I knew that with the shotgun mic, 
because it's directional, I'm, it, which it's great, it'll isolate, uh, it, it'll isolate the voice a little better, but that means I have to be closer to my subject. So I get closer. Uh, this is a story about snow plows. It was two people, two burly, handsome men oper operating a, uh, what, a, um, a, a snow plow business and road maintenance business. So we did the interviews inside of the uh, cab of the car. Um, that meant I was close to my subject. I can get good audio from them reliably. There's a little LED on here that lets me know what my audio level is at, if it's peaking or not. And um, so this meant I was shooting very handheld. We were very much getting a point of view perspective from me. Um, and what ended up happening essentially was I ended up getting a more dynamic shoot than I would have expected um, had I just done it with conventional way, done it on, on six. Um, I ended up getting the guy to shoot my on cams that day. I decided it would be a fun on cam if I, if I got in the plow and just accelerated in the plow and he let me drive the plow. So I put the camera in his hands. It was just an iPhone. All he had to do was point and shoot. And they kind of made for a great sound up of an engine revving. And that was great for, for the promo. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you guys for a little bit of participation here. I'm going to give you a, um, oh, hold on. I'm getting a little too ahead of myself here. Let me just share my screen. Let's see what slide I'm on. Um, yeah, some other, I'm going to talk about some other tech considerations. Um, I think the other things that are saving me a lot, a crunch time, just memorizing editing shortcuts, shortcuts. I mean, yeah, you just, that means go fast. Uh, there are some tools that you could drag around uh, that to make operations that are way better done if you just, if you just like reduce them to a single key. Um, learn how your camera likes to expose things, right? Uh, since you're on your own, see if you can, like, if you're shooting a stand-up, like, why not try testing the shots before you roll for real? There are functions on the, um, pardon me, there are, fun I mean, there are, there's, like, these measurements on the, a lens of a conventional news camera that lets you know how far away your focal point has to be. That can help you measure how far away you need to be from your camera. Um, and about camera exposure there are some scenarios where iphones succeed better than in other scenarios like because electronic news gathering cameras also have their limits depending on like what you're working with perhaps you have a fully exposed background maybe there's like a stadium like i'm thinking about bc place in vancouver that's lit perfectly at at dusk you know what i mean that's like really glowing but you're in the foreground and you're slightly underexposed and you can never expose yourself properly depending on the kind of camera you have maybe you don't have a bright enough light so that might inform where you decide to direct your shot. You might want to shoot it with an iPhone, actually, because the autofocus, or sorry, the auto exposure in, on an iPhone, for some reason, it just, it more easily, I guess, um, I guess, I guess reconciles the light difference between a, a, like kind of a dark foreground and a bright background, which is like why an iPhone or another smartphone is just so powerful. It just, um, yeah, it, it, ba it balances shots really quickly on the fly. And then final, final point here, just learn how to monitor all your audio in, in every situation because bad audio can basically just like ruin a whole interview, like a whole clip or a whole take. So just like know your audio gear and how it maybe might react in every scenario. There are some microphones that have like a attenuation level that helps you cut out background noise. How does a certain attenuation level on a microphone work on a city corner? versus a park. And then once you take that, once you maybe do some test shots of that and see how that sounds, then you can kind of take that knowledge to every other single shoot. You're perhaps in a different area that you don't know very well, but it sounds kind of loud. And you're thinking, is this as loud as that corner that I was standing on when I tested that shot that one time? Um, and then you can kind of like go from there because sometimes with your audio gear for a phone, it might be hard to monitor with like actual headphones if you don't have the right input. So. Yeah, that it's it's important to kind of kind of figure out figure that out, and that's a good way to, uh, I guess, you know, doing those test shots, figuring out how your audio gear, gear works. Um, that's a way. That's a good way to kind of find a metric for yourself as you go out into different scenarios in the field. Now I'm going to tell you guys about a shooting scenario, and I want you to kind of participate here. Um, send anonymous answers to Trevor Coral in the chat if you like. Uh, we're gonna try something cool. What would you do in this situation? Um, I'm gonna just uh, let me see here. Your main interview is an environmental activist, okay, you with me? Um, you're hoping to meet them in their home because like they have visual, you wanted to get visuals of their workshop, you know, uh, like maybe they have a bunch of like, like illicit stuff, like, you know, paint canisters that are ready to like spray it like an Aston Martin, I don't know, 
you know, it, it, uh, but suddenly they have to, they arrange to like meet in a nearby park because their home location is, is sensitive and they won't do it otherwise. It's just a park. So what do you do? Um, and your ideas to Trevor in the chat. I'm, I'm curious to know what you guys would want to do. Get footage of the scenery. If there's litter and trash, that's probably better. Nice, nice. It's like a bit of like a metaphor there, you know what I mean? What else? You have to have the proper gear. I would uh, I would sit them maybe at a, a park bench or something and and use that as my my setting. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, some of the other shots that I I would try to do. Um, you know, often we have to kind of show ourselves like collecting the uh, go to the park and determine the setup. Okay. okay. Um, I, I would maybe get like, make sure I get a two shot of myself and the subject, because that'll give us a good establishing shot if I need to introduce the subject with a voiceover. Really easy to just cut to a two shot of both of us, establish location that way, and establish that they're talking to you on screen. Um, you're in a park, you know, there's, there's leaves, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you, you can, you, uh, there are opportunities for B-roll. I mean, like, yeah, you're, you're, it, you're talking to an environmental activist who, who cares about I don't know the, the environment about about nature? Show pictures of nature. Show ask them about I don't know like their favorite flower or or branch. I don't know favorite tree. Um, maybe you could ask them to bring something from their uh, illicit <laughs> no workshop. Show them you know like make them bring bring a prop from there if they can't bring the whole workshop. Or you could shoot other things like lips and hands that might you know, convey some sort of, um, some sort of emotion or, or what, what they're doing. So, yeah. Thanks for that, you guys. I always like to ask myself what's possible with, with what you got, you know what I mean? And I think this kind of like really speaks to that sort of last point, um, that, that, that last scenario that I was describing about, uh, just like kind of forgetting all my SD cards and having to shoot with the phone. What can you do? Um, and I, I think as a VJ asking yourself that question, um, gets into this mind, gets us into this mindset where we have to like know that we have to adapt. Um, I'm going to tell you guys about some of the gear that I use. Uh, I'm going to, this is great. This is from yesterday. I was covering a decampment yesterday um, and I thought this would be a good thing to, this is, a, this is on East Hastings Street in Vancouver, um, probably like the, the, the densest, um, it has like the densest population of unhoused people, I think in the country really. And this is like one of the main big beats I cover in the, in the city. And there's basically, uh, even ongoing to today, it's like the second day of a um, of major decamment involving a lot of police presence, like over a hundred officers to basically get every single tent off, off of the street. Um, we were expecting it to maybe kind of get a, a bit rough. So, um, you know, we, we, uh, we, we came down here and uh, I, I knew I had to kind of pack for everything. Um, and I'll kind of describe some of the gear that I, gear that I have there. Um, in my right hand, obviously, is the camera. Uh, there's a receiver there. I have my headphones with me to, to monitor audio. On you can't, you can't kind of see. There's a little blue flash underneath my left armpit there. That's actually my, that's actually my, my wireless microphone. And that's connected to the receiver on top of... Uh, on top of the camera, and then what's happening with um, what's happening for audio for me? I'm shooting an on cam right here, right now, like an on camera bridge to let the viewer know where I'm going. Um, on my right lapel, you see I have a little thing clipped to that, um, and that is let me pull it over here and bring it on screen. This is the Rode Wireless Go 2, and it's connected to a receiver that's connected to the iPhone and I, I guess clip it onto itself so it's light and I can get really, really excellent audio just between these two things. This has attenuation, so like on a loud street, you're gonna still get clear audio. And um, that's basically how I ended up shooting this, this thing on camera. Uh, what else is kind of going on there? Um, yeah, so you guys know I shoot with an iPhone 11. Um, you know, I use that microphone. I use also this, this phone stabilizer. Uh, that I showed you a little bit earlier. And this has a bunch of different attached, uh, you know, different places for me to kind of maybe put a light, a shotgun microphone, clip my receiver onto here, put the iPhone in, and 
helps me create a stable shot if I decide to go shoot a little lighter um, with, uh, with with an iPhone and kind of a, kind of take it to that kind of take it to that next level so you don't get all that camera shake. Um, let's see here. Besides that, uh, when I'm editing, when I'm editing, I, I tend to use a I don't actually have it on me at the second, but it's uh, it's like a, a Wacom tablet with a pen, and I use that to edit uh, edit my footage. I find it a lot faster than using a a mouse because basically it's like this pad, and it's mapped to different portions of your screen. And doing that is a lot faster because when you take the pen to one side, it like the cursor doesn't even drag; it just goes to wherever your pen goes. That's a really fast way, combined with shortcuts, that I use to kind of edit really really quickly. Um, yeah, you know, um, it, I also had, uh, what else did I kind of have with me here? You know, I'm just going to stop sharing the screen here for a second. I'm just going to change my, just switch over to the other camera for a sec. Uh, right. So the other stuff that I kind of had with me, um, I had this shotgun microphone just in case I ran out of batteries. Um, and, you know, this is a, a tripod that I kept in the car. This kind of carries the uh, this carries the, the phone stabilizer bracket thing. And yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys. Well, uh, sorry, sorry, I just wanted to read out a few comments because I think they're pretty good and, um, cool. and we are recording the webinar and it will be available later. And I think they're, um, pretty good, um, points to make. And, uh, D Desmond Lorraine says, and I'm apologies if I pronounce your name here, uh, adapting and compromise seem to be real skills to have. And <laughs> I think that's sort of what you're speaking about. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, totally. and uh, Brahim here, sorry again, uh, I feel like you were actually on set, always ready to move. Um, and I just thought those were, uh, those were great questions uh, or great statements and just sort of encapsulating uh, what, uh, what, uh, what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, well, well said. And you know what, uh, the one thing I didn't mention was that I was using a monopod for my, um, for, for my setup that day, uh, yesterday, um, because I wanted to just be, just be more agile, pretty much. Um, Let's uh, let's talk about creative shooting next. You know, um, I, I want to hear from you guys. Like, what's at the heart? You know, we hear about creative shooting all the time, but like, what's what's really at the heart of this? You know what I mean? Like, uh, please let Trevor know in the chat. Like, what do you feel compelled to? Well, when you're seeing video, that's compelling. Like, what's compelling to you? Like, when you see video, like, what makes you stop and be like, "Whoa, that's cool." You know? Um, what do you guys think? I'll go first because we uh, we we talked about this already. But for me, it's always the uh, something I've never seen before, or um, something happening that makes me really my eyes uh, open wide. And uh, I see a lot of video, but it does it does happen, and uh, that's when I know it's like uh, a a really great piece of video. Yeah, yeah, for sure, Trevor. I think you know um, the thing that's really great about video journalism and. Uh, I'm trying to talk about this distinction about being someone who was in print and then decided to do more video journalism. I used to think about the lead of my story in terms of prose. What does what do my words look like? What are they conveying? But after when you're doing video journalism, you're really thinking about your lead in terms of sound and visual, um, like really visceral stuff. And um, I think we can like kind of play on this really. I mean, there's something populist about video journalism way on TV. It's like you can kind of play on this primal urge for people to say, "Whoa, cool." Well, cool. What was that? You know, um, I was shooting a story about like a about water, water a water reserve, um, a reservoir, and I noticed that there was a dam and like this enormous waterfall going up, just like beautiful. And if I felt like that was compelling, I think someone else might find that compelling too. So there was nothing left to say at the beginning of my pack except bringing up the sound and visuals of that waterfall falling. You know what I mean? So yeah, compelling sound and visuals, like a dynamic shot, some lively colors. Some of these things I think are, are, are sort of at the heart of them. Great. You have an answer from the chat, uh, a cool angle sequence or action that someone's doing. Nice, nice. Desmond says, I'm a sucker for real depth of field in interviews. A boring backdrop can be so dynamic just by blurring it out. Yeah, totally. The perspective, angle of the shots, the music that goes with it. Sound important, sound easy, but complicated in different contexts. Working on catching sounds in a packed place if you don't have the proper gear is crazy. Nature shots too. That's why I love being up from the north. So unique. Cool. Yeah, I've always wanted to go for a road trip up there. Truly. Um, yeah. So you know, how can we elevate a TV package or like a social media story, right? Um, well, I mean, there's a there's a couple of things. Like uh, you know, you can try to include process in your storytelling, right? Like 
how did you get to your shoot? Um, is, is it an interesting place? Maybe you'd be interested to show just like your, your footsteps getting there, the sequence of, so the viewer feels like they're getting there. Um, if, if the story warrants it, you could also try something out on, on camera with, with your subject, you know, try it out for the viewer, let them feel that. I would say be as literal as possible with, with your B-roll. Um, that, that's really great. But, you know, so when you're looking at your visuals, like um, keep it with your writing in mind. Are you going to write to those visuals? And I, I think that's, you know, I think that's like a longstanding TV principle, like just like writing to visuals, but at the same time, like experiment and try like some metaphorical B-roll sometimes. Um, I mean, like, you know, I guess it depends on your strength of making metaphors, but I think those can kind of be a cool thing too. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna like switch to my other camera here for a sec. Uh, you know, someone was saying in in the chat there, like trying to find different angles. Like why, you know what, I think a mistake that some people make sometimes, like when they're out there shooting a, a news event or something, is just getting only the wide shot. Cause like, sure, you get there, you're like, oh, I gotta shoot, I gotta shoot the news. It's in front of me. Like this is this is what I got. This is what I got. And they'll just keep shooting wide shots the whole time. But the thing is, you can't cut between wide shots, really, because it feels kind of like jarring to the viewer. You need close up stuff. So, um, you know, but, but before we get out of wide shots, so, you know, like you could try, of course, like, you know, lower angles. Like, why not the lower ones? I mean, this is kind of a funny example, <laughs> but, but you get it right. It's kind of like, you know, why your eyes wouldn't typically down, be down here. So it feels novel or like, why not? Why not up high? Could that be could that be an interesting way to do it um or you know if you do have to shoot an eye level like maybe it makes sense narratively right like maybe maybe you're at a protest and there's like an incredible crowd so like for yourself like walking through the crowd you know what i mean at eye level show yourself there maybe sticking out your hand and like like taking a pamphlet from like a another activist and like reading that you know having a pamphlet up it's like it's doubling as information at the same time you know what i mean um, that you can kind of describe uh, through a voiceover. Um, yeah, like, put, you know, put your, put your viewer in the scene. Um, on smartphones, iPhones tend to really excel at macro photography. So like really, really close up shots. So like bring the lens like really up close. And this is good because I can finally have this coffee that I've been waiting to have, you know, some process. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. You can bring like the iPhone up to this. Like if you, especially if you tend to, um, keep something in the background, you can usually use your finger to tap on different points of focus in your frame to differentiate. And that can kind of make for like a, a big rack focus shot. That's really cool. Um, yeah. And, and then finally, I think, you know, something that I'm seeing more and more with shooters and, and, and DJs out there is just more drones are being used. I don't have one yet, but like they, I think they're excellent for really so many applications and they are really near to, po they're near to pocket size models that are sort of available now. Um, you know, like if I were shooting a story about like VJing today, I don't know, like, and I wanted to take you through the details, I think, um, details are the most interesting thing to kind of, uh, like put on camera because they, you can just get so close and, uh, and, and I can do it all in one shot and I don't have to keep cutting. I can go to my next shot. I could use this whole sequence together and just like speed up parts of the footage and post if I wanted to. Or I could cut this footage just later. I could cut, do just hard cuts between all my items here on the desk. If I really wanted to. If I really wanted to. I could do all that and maybe shoot an on-cam about how coffee powers journalists. Ah, that's, that's great. <laughs> I really needed that. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, I think TV news doesn't have to be all the same. I mean, like within reason, I think um, sometimes like it, it's not possible for every story. Like not every story has to be like a theatric masterpiece. Sometimes you just got to get information out there and you might have to, if you're at a new organization, just like work with footage that you get from other shooters in the field. And sometimes that a lot of that stuff might like be on sticks. It might be, it might feel in my opinion, like kind of sort of conventional and that it's on sticks. It's a left to right pan, still very effective. It's an up and down tilt. When you combine it with VJ footage, when you're, well, I like to describe, call it BJ footage, because like when you're there sh taking the side yourself, getting details, right? Getting details, um, that can really break up uh, some of the more traditional shots that you might have to work with, because they're 
share their stock their their stock footage that has been ingested that you couldn't get on a certain day, right? So, yeah. Um, hold on, I'm just gonna change my. I hope you guys aren't motion sick. I'm really moving this camera like so fast. <laughs> okay, there we go. We're back. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I'll like leave you guys with this. You know, as a, as a VJ, you're usually gonna operate as a one man band, and there are a lot of pros and cons to this. Um, I mean, the cons like it's it's a lot of work, right? It's it, it, you're really managing so many different things. But I think the biggest pro is that you can get like someone argue you can get so much closer to a story as a solo VJ since you're sort of relieved from like some of the impersonality that crewing can have. I think um, I we were talking a lot about tech today, but um, I think my most successful stories are probably the ones where people like just trusted me, trusted my camera. And I think that's it's, that's why it's really important for us to do right as people. And I think as, as journalists, especially as TV journalists, as video journalists, public perceptions of what we do and what our cameras are and what our cameras mean, I think public perceptions of those things often precede us. And I think um, knowing that is especially important among populations of people that journalists have maybe failed to cover equitably in the past. So in this world where we were hitting record on a camera or on a phone has a lot of power, like how can we use, you know, how can we use that responsibly? Um, I, I, to, to kind of sum it up, I would say like reassure people, you're gonna work with sensitive, uh, this is specifically speaking to like people that are particularly sensitive sources, um, reassure them that it's maybe it's a pre-recorded thing and you can, and you can say like, you know, it's pre-recorded, like if you mess up something, if you stumble, you can say this again. Um, if I'll probably use like, it's not gonna be like on you the whole time, like there's other people in the story with you, you're not telling this by yourself. Um, just like show them, like try to feed some, I, I think people we should, as journalists, we should try to feed some of that agency and help people like give informed consent. That said, you know, I think all this really has to go out the window when you bump into like a cabinet minister on, <laughs> on, the, on the sidewalk. Like forget all that stuff. I think you just have to start rolling in that scenario. And that is like really the power of video journalism. Um, before we get to some questions, I just want to like leave you with this. This is, you know, you, um, you know uh, my friend, my journalist friend Michael is in the chat. He sent me this picture. And if you're not familiar, this is a, this is a TV show called Invincible. That's Omni Man. Uh, and they, they had it labeled as MMJs, multimedia journalists, looking at two fighter planes labeled documentary truth with, people, two, with five people. Look at what they need to mimic a fraction of our power. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just love that. So, Michael, thank you for sharing that with me. And uh, yeah, you know, we got some time to do some questions. Um, all right. So I think um, maybe what I've, I've found out is that uh, maybe you cannot send anonymous answers to me, but if you want to, I think you can post them. I think you can uh, choose to reply anonymously in the chat uh, if you are um, looking to do that. I guess here, my question, maybe to start us off, would just be sort of, um, you know, if I'm starting out today and I want to, you know, if I'm a student journalist or something and I want to um, go cover a protest, what sort of, you know, I have an iPhone or a smartphone, you know, what, what sort of audio equipment do I need to, um, you know, produce professional or what would you recommend um, if I had to, had to maybe get one thing? Um... Right, right. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's a good question. I think, you know, I think I would probably pick up a lavalier mic kit. Um, I, that, oh, sorry, I'm going to stop sharing the thing here. Um, I think I would probably pick up a lavalier mic kit, like the one I kind of just described last time. Like these guys, um, these, you know, you're gonna, what's really gonna, you could tell your story with just the visuals of a protest, but we'll, we'll take it to the next level, interviewing people, interviewing people that are actually maybe affected, like a decanment, for example, like I was covering the other day. Um, so the lavalier mic thing is great. Those things I had like, external lavalier mics like kind of attached to them, but they also, uh, let's see, they also come, you can also, you also just take these out. And you, if you've been like watching TikTok lately, like I see a lot of creators actually using these. These can just be sort of clipped on um, really fast and you don't have to, and speed, speed is everything sometimes. Like, so like this is a lot more finicky than just like clipping this on, which is, which is really great. So I, I would maybe pick up one of these and, you know, um, you can even use it to get sound by a, 
by just like pointing it at a like pointing it at something. If you don't have like a shotgun mic, you could use this theoretically just to get directional sound that way. Even though I think this is like an omnidirectional microphone, but that's one way to get sound. Like this is now ears in your hand. So I think yeah, that would probably be my recommendation. Um, do you have any tips for shooting your own standups? Ah yes, for shooting standups. Um, I would say like, you know, I like to, this is like part of like the city style. We try to like, try to avoid shooting just like a stand up where we're, where like the background isn't like completely intentionally, you know, sometimes you just gotta, and, and you might not be able to get the most literal background for your um, shooting scenario, but like really the world, the world really is your prop, you know? Um, and as VJs, like the, the style at City was, they really wanted to show, like way back in the day, they wanted to show the video journalist's connection to the camera. And like back in the day, they were shooting with like beta cams and stuff and small digital cameras and getting that selfie view in like the 90s, which was like, it kind of like surreal if you think about it. Um, so I would say interact with your environment, uh, like look at where you're at and, tr and you have to be creative and see what you can do with what's around you. Um, I shot a story about like, you know, what could have been like a pretty rote, like, you know, like 16 million provincial grant funding to an organization that was creating like peer youth support positions in Vancouver. Um, but this was a story about how it's hard for youth to grow up. You know, it, it's hard, for, it's hard growing up. So I was like, oh, damn, like, how do I illustrate this? Like, what can I do? Like, I just, I'm just driving around. I end up in a park. Um, I'm like, if only growing up was as like, maybe this is lame. If only growing up was as easy as walking in a park. Like that's basically the direction I took. And I was like, I can use myself walking in this park and pivot to talking about this federal announcement. And all that for the merit of at least having an interesting hook at the beginning of my story so people watch. And it's kind of an angular way to get into what would have been like a policy story. So don't be afraid of metaphors. Don't be afraid of like interacting with your environment. You can challenge yourself to make a stand up with anything that you have at like your disposal. You know what I mean? Right here, like, you know, I kind of did that little funny thing where I like open this can. Like, that's a sound up. That's a sound up at the beginning of your pack. Or typing here on the keyboard. That's a sound up. That's a sound up if it makes sense, right? So, yeah, those are kind of my. Yeah, great. Um, the next question here uh, I can see that tripods and monopods have different benefits for different scenarios. Is there ever a time when you would bring only one or the other? Is there a time where you ever only bring one or? So, yeah, um, a monopod or uh, or a tripod. Oh, monopod, sorry. yes. Or the tripod. Um, yeah, you know, like I think yesterday I brought just the tripod. Sorry, just the monopod because I know I knew I had to be agile. I didn't want to stop. I, I saw myself moving faster to different shots compared to other um, shooters in the field that were shooting with just tripods. Even those, um, even those other shooters that were just shooter editors, like they eventually abandoned their tripods. <laughs> and like they were just like shooting handheld because they needed to be faster, right? So that's a really, um, that, that's a scenario where, um, yeah, that, that's a scenario where I would have just brought a monopod. Where I would just bring only a tripod, I mean, uh, there isn't a scenario where I would just bring only a tripod. Sometimes I bring it just because it's comfortable and I want my hands to be free um, and it is just easier in that sense. Yeah. So like, I, I can't think of anything specific where I would just, where I'm like, I need a tripod for this kind of thing. But um, I use it if I just like straight up want a stable shot sometimes, you know what I mean? And I want to maybe, maybe I'll make that shot more dynamic by like shooting more two shots and shooting other process with, with the interviewee afterwards. Great. Um, when when does the VJ stop and the journalist start? Uh, can, can, is there a difference? <laughs> oh, that's that, that's an interesting question. Um, like today, we we were talking a lot about like you know kind of like the creative shooting aspects and like making make making something look visually interesting. Um, I I think on I, I really do believe they they are intertwined. Uh, you know I think shooting you know, what, whatever you frame it, I mean, like you're making a narrative decision still, right? You're making a narrative decision for your, uh, sorry, I think there's a clarification on that question. The journal. It is when. I, I worked it into oh, when, my, uh, Right, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah. 
I, I think they're really intertwined. I, I, I genuinely believe that. Like we're talking all, all about the things that just like make something visually interesting. I mean, I didn't really talk about all the chase production that still happens. I didn't talk about like still trying to gather statements from, um, the, you still have to send out emails. I'm not gonna, <laughs> you, know, you still have to send out emails and like, a, a, and get official statements from, from whoever it is. Um, you know, like I just remember stopping, I do remember stopping a provincial cabinet minister on the street, our minister of social, uh, social development and poverty reduction on Hastings where incidentally there was a decampment. Um, and that's, that, that was power, just showing, showing the camera towards that person and just like having them not be able to give a candid answer there. So yeah, I don't think you can really separate them. Um, you still have to send emails as a VC. I'm, gonna, I'm going to remember that one. Um, <laughs> oh, well, this is uh, last one. And I think we talked a little bit about it, but I think it's, um, I think it's a good question. And we can end on this because I know we are at time. Um, how do you deal with the stress of being in the field and still needing to perform many tasks or roles? Right, right. Um, shooting and interviewing. Uh, well, you know, I guess a big part of it is that I'm very comfortable with my technical abilities with a lot of the gear that I have. So that stuff, I, it's, I don't really think about that task, technical aspect anymore. It's like really like the back of my hand and I don't, I just don't think about it anymore. And I find myself these days focusing more on the narrative and like all the other stuff sort of melts away, which is kind of a great position like for me to be at. It took a while to kind of get there. Um, there are all other tasks like interviewing and things like that. You know, since I work at like City News, like I do have like a supervising producer who, if I was in a pinch, like, can you send this email to <laughs> to the Vancouver Police Department? Can you get a statement from the city on this? Um, so like there, there is there is support, you know what I mean? And I guess like what I'm kind of speaking to is just like the more autonomous parts of the role that um, when you when you do operate autom autonomously, like 90 percent of the time, um, you know, like the, the things that I would that I personally wouldn't delegate. Yeah, like that's kind of what I'm speaking to. But um, having knowing that I do have support like back at the newsroom helps as well. Okay, maybe we could, uh, here, we could rapid fire these last two questions because they did come sure. in just as I said we were going to end it, but we, I think we can do it. What are your tips uh, on best ways to approach strangers? Um, yeah, just like, you know, start rolling, be friendly. Like, I, I just I just start rolling, and if they don't want to be on, then they say they don't want to be on, and I respect that. You know, I just, like, I just throw the answer at them. Um, yeah, streeters are tough. <laughs> But okay, fine, the final uh, official uh, official final one, um, when shooting in a setting where there are other VJs or videographers, uh, how do you make sure you have the best shot without ruining other people's shots? Right. So that's typically like in a scrum situation. And I find in those scenarios, honestly, you just like you got <laughs> to kind of get there first sometimes. Um, otherwise, like if you can make time, like it's worth stopping the person at the scrum to do like a solo interview on the side. Um, takes a little bit of gumption, I'm sure, but it's worth doing that sometimes. Getting there earlier before everybody else does also helps. Um, and you just like do the interview beforehand and then you don't, have, you don't even have to do the scrum and you'll probably have better clips that way. Um, so yeah, those, those are kind of the things that, um, hey, I, you know, anon anonymous attendee, I'm small too. I'm like 5'2" maybe five, three, and I have been shoved around a little, <laughs> a little bit too. Um, so yeah, yeah, get there early or stay a bit late. Um, okay, Kira, I don't know if you want to, I'm just gonna say uh, goodbye. I don't know if you wanna put up your um, your contact information. Oh yeah, um, I will. <laughs> you should stick around for the contact information. There's a little treat at the end. Um, I, anyway, I, I don't so. know, I don't know why. I just decided to like show, like this is um, <laughs> me as a child. If you want to contact me, there's all my contact info. Anyways, and we will, thumbs up from Young Pierre. We will end on that. Um, thank you so much, Kier.